Okay, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up or turn them on if that's your preference. We're going to be in Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 20. If you grabbed your Bible from the back, we're going to be on page 1041. So go ahead and hold your spot right there, and we're going to dive in in just a moment. This has really been just an emotional roller coaster of a month. I was so excited when I found out that I had the opportunity to share this particular message. This is a message that I've, I've read over countless times. I've, I've gone over it. I've shared it with friends. I've shared it with family. With this message, this is the very beginning. It's like the key that opens the gate to what the gospel is truly about. So it's a very exciting piece of scripture. So I began writing some notes down and trying to figure out what exactly am I going to be saying here. And so I finally got my outline together, and I made what I think was a, a pretty bad mistake. And I, I'm going to put the blame on you all right here, just between <laughs> our groups, because I feel like I've been here long enough that you guys should have warned me about this, but you didn't. And so I'm a little upset. I sat my wife down and said, oh, beloved wife of mine, can you listen to my message and maybe give me some feedback on it? The idea was when I was finished with the message, I'd get some good feedback and I could make some adjustments. I got maybe three minutes into my message and my wife's, oh, really? I'm like, okay, what, what, what was that about? She's like, are you really going to say that? I was like, well, I, I thought it sounded good. She's like, okay, don't worry, just keep going. So I keep going and I'm giving, I'm trying to be in it and animated about it and just pour my heart into it. And she's like, no, no, stop, stop. I'm like, what? She's like, you think that joke is going to work? I'm like, absolutely. She's like, no, if you say Monty Python joke on stage, it is totally going to bomb. You can't do that. I said, okay, so that part's been taken out. Uh, so I kept going, and finally, after about halfway through my message, I realized that, okay, I, I can't do this. This, this just isn't going to work. So I had to scratch that idea. But luckily, the very next morning, she went out to go to a Bible study with some of her friends. So it left me at home to raise and watch the kids and, and be with them. So here was a great idea. If I sit my kids on the couch... And if they can understand this message and maybe repeat some of it back to me, that they grasped it, then everybody out here can probably going to understand it too. So I thought this was a brilliant idea. So I sat them down, and I, I grabbed everything, set it up, and I started right in. About a minute and a half in, my 11-year-old, Eleni, she starts raising her hand and asking questions. And I start answering, but, but that really upset my 12-year-old, so he started rebuking Eleni and said, No, listen, Eleni, I'm not in Kid City anymore. I'm in the regular service, and nobody's going to interrupt Renault while he's speaking. <laughs> so she starts yelling with him. He starts yelling with her. They're in an argument. I'm only a minute and a half in. This is not looking good. I turn to my right-hand side, and I've Caden, my 9-year-old, and Chloe, my 6-year-old. They've got pen and paper out. So I'm like, okay, they're taking notes. There might be some hope here. But what they did is then they lifted it up and they had a number five on it. So they were already grading me on a scale of one to ten on how well I'm doing. So from right now, either I am at a five on my way to a ten, and maybe this could be good, or I started at a ten, I'm already at a five, and it's just only going to go downhill from here. At this point, I figure that things cannot get any worse. Then out of the corner of my eye, my almost two-year-old comes streaking into the living room. I don't know where his diaper went, and he starts dancing in the middle of the floor. My kids lose it. They start laughing. I'm not three minutes in, I figured this just, this isn't going to work. So I've got to figure out a different game plan. Well, that night we had our small group, and Miss Jessica, who sometimes comes with me here, she came over to our house, and I said, Miss Jessica, can I just read this verse to you? I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around it and trying to figure out what can I do to really share this, and maybe you can give me some feedback. So I go through and I read the verse to her, and she's like, oh, man. I'm like, I know, right? I mean, this is a tough verse, but I think if we really just get to the point of it and share it in the right way. She's like, no, you sound like a DJ when you read that. I'm like, what? And she's like, no, you, you, you sound like you're performing this. You can't perform it. You just got to read it. And so at this point, I'm completely crushed. I'm completely humbled. And I was like, I have no idea what I'm even going to do anymore. So after small group, she leaves. I go into my room. I open up my laptop. And I said, OK, I'm just going to start over. I'm going to just calm down. And I'm just going to ask God, God, please help me. And it's at that point, I, I open up my email, and I see an email from Brady. And he has laid out beautifully, amazingly, the entire section of this verse. So I grab my Bible. I open up the laptop. I'm looking at these verse. I'm looking at his great uh, exegetical flips that he's been doing to bring all this together, all the context. And I don't even know if I'm in the right passage anymore. I don't even know if what I've understood is even what's going on. So I'm reading through this. 
And before I know it, it's like, I don't even know if I understand the Bible anymore. I don't even know if I should even be in here because this is so amazing and so rich and so deep. And here I'm just looking at this saying, oh, this is cool. Let me go ahead and speak on it. And it's that then I realized something so beautiful and amazing that we can read a verse so many times and not see the depths and the beauty of it. And even the most popular verses, if we can take time and marinate it and meditate on it, we can see something so beautiful and so great. So I hope that during our time here, we'll be able to see something and bring something out of this text that we've never seen before. I warn you, I still haven't gotten through this message once already. I was trying to do it earlier today, but we'll see. We'll just see what happens. So please give me a little bit of grace as we go through this. So let's go ahead and open it up. Chapter 3, verse 9 through 20. We'll read it all the way through, and then we'll take it apart verse by verse. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both the Jews and the Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks God. All have turned aside, and together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave, they use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, and in their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Now I'm not sure if you have a daily devotional or something that you do to kind of kickstart your day and, and get your head off on the right foot. But my idea is that if you wake up in the morning and you understand they say, I'm not righteous, I don't understand, I don't even seek God, let's grab a cup of coffee and let's get this day started. That's probably not the way we normally like to get our day started. And so when we come to an area like this, it's shocking to begin with. But then we've got to understand what is Paul saying? What Paul is doing here is he's trying to let us know where our condition is. So if we fully understand our condition, we're going to be able to fully understand the beauty of the gospel. So it's going to start out really bad, but hopefully by the end of this, we'll see something really good. It's like Super Bowl 51 for the Patriot fans. It's like you start, I, I had to at least throw something in there. Okay, So just forgive me for that one. Okay. <laughs> There's only three ways to take this message. One is we read these words and we understand our condition, but because we understand our condition and what Jesus has done for us because of this, this is why we sing, this is why we rejoice, this is why we praise God, because we have the ability through this understanding to stand before a righteous and holy and just God because of our condition and what Jesus had to do to fulfill that. So this is a great passage, and if we look at it that way, we can go out into the lobby after this and give high fives and hugs because of this scripture. But maybe you, you don't quite understand it that way. If you turn back a page to Romans 1.16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, and here's the key point, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And what is awesome about that is it's, it's not what I say, so I don't have to worry about trying to convince you of this. If the Holy Spirit were to open your eyes and you read this, this great, beautiful thing and you understand and you say, oh, I get it. I didn't understand this before, but now I get it. That is what Paul is saying, that it's the gospel, the very words of God that has the understanding that can be given to you so that your eyes are open and that you understand this. And then when you understand that, then you're going to feel the same way about this verse. So it's no longer going to be verses of condemnation. It's going to be verses of joy because we understand what had to happen so that we can be at the point that we are now. The third way of taking this is that we have now confirmed your suspicion that Christians are absolutely crazy. And you're counting down the time so you can get up out of here and never return. I mean, those are the three ways that you can take this message. The fourth way that you could take it, which really isn't really a way, and be indifferent about this message, is if you're on your Bible app right now, but really you're scrolling through Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and you're not really paying attention. I mean, those are really the only ways that this can go out right now. So let's go ahead and dive into verse 9, and we'll see what Paul's saying. We start off with two words, what then? Well, what what? Whenever Paul uses something like what then or therefore, you've got to find out what is it there for. 
So we have to backtrack a little bit and see why we're at this point. If you remember back in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, Paul is opening up the condition of men. And he's starting out with the Greeks or the Gentiles or the non-Jews. And he's saying to these people, look, there's all these sins that you've committed. And the only reason that you can commit all of these sins is because you've had to suppress the knowledge of God. You can't say that because I don't have the law, I don't know God. It, God has made himself evident in everything around. His fingerprint is on this entire creation. You have to see God all around you. And the only way you can't is if you suppress that. And so that's what Paul is sharing is that, hey, you're under sin just as much because you do know, but you're trying to say that you don't. And a great example of that is let's look at the last verse in chapter 1. In verse 32 it says, Though they know God's righteous decree... That those who practice such things, these are all the sins I just listed, they deserve to die. But they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. Kind of like what Renault was talking about earlier, this approval process that keeps happening that not only do they do these bad things, but now we're trying to say, hey, it's not only that we do this, but hey, it's okay. And so we mentioned last week that it's like we're in a courtroom and... The, the Greeks over here, and we're, we're condemning them, and, and God's the judge, and the Jews are in the jury. But then Paul does something pretty shocking here. He turns to the Jews, he says, actually, get up out of the jury box, because you're over here as well. You are just as condemned as them. And it's not you that's in the jury, it's actually God in the jury. And so then he goes through, and he says, you think that you're good, that you can stand before a righteous and just and holy God because you have the law. And you think that by having the law that that's the reason why you're okay. And that's the same way if we do in modern days. That's like the same thing as saying, oh, I was born to Christian parents, so I'm a, I'm a Christian. Or I go to church three days a week, and I wear a blue shirt, so because of that, I'm a Christian. No, that's actually not what it's saying at all. It's not our works, what Paul is saying. It, it's more than that. You can't just have the law. You've got to do the law. And so that's what he's saying here. And so as we go through, we, we can look at Romans chapter 2, verse 12, and get an understanding of that. Let's check that out right now. For all who have sinned without the law, now we're going back to the Greeks, will also perish without the law. And all those who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. So here he's basically saying, if you don't have the law, you're still condemned. If you have the law, you're still condemned because you're going to be judged by that. So now that we've talked about the Greeks, we've talked about the Jews, where are we at now? Let's go ahead and read that verse in its entirety. So what then? Are we Jews any better off? So Paul's still talking to the Jews in this context. And what's the answer? No, not at all. For we have already charged, I've already told you basically, we've already charged that all, both the Jews and the Greeks, are under sin. The... A good way I think I can explain this is imagine there's three guys and they're working out. And they're on the 10th the story of a building and on the 10th floor is a gym. And so the first guy, he's up there and he's, it's his very first day. He's a little late on this New Year's resolution idea. But he's up there in his first day and he's pumping iron. He's trying to get in shape. He's got goals that he wants to reach. And the second guy who's there, he's been working out for a year. So he's starting to hit his goals, he's feeling good, he's got a lot of energy, he's starting to get some good muscle mass. And then the third person, this is the guy who actually owns the gym, he was the 2016 gold medal long jumper. I mean, this guy is ripped, he is awesome. And not only that, he's already training for the 2020 Olympics. I mean, he is ready to go. Well, they're in there and they're working out, and all of a sudden they hear the fire alarms go off. So they don't know what's going on, so they run downstairs to see what's happened, but the bottom floor has already been engulfed in flames. And flames are rising up this building, so they have nowhere to go except to the very top floor. They get to the top floor, and they're looking around. They've got to find some sort of escape path. But the whole building is being taken over by flames. But they spot another building next by that they can jump to. And if they can just jump to that building, they'll be okay. The problem is, is there's a six-lane highway that separates the building between each other. So the first person, he takes a couple of steps back. He's really nervous and scared. He goes and he jumps but he doesn't make it past the sidewalk or road. The second person, well, he's in better shape, so he takes a little bit further back, and he's trying to calculate what he needs to do, and finally he just runs and he leaps off, but he only makes it to the first lane. But now the second person, or the last person, he's the Olympic long jumper. If anybody can do it, he can do it. So he knows if he can get in the very back corner, if he can hit the ledge just right and use all of his muscle power to leap, he's going to have a chance to make it. So he gets all the way to the back. He's feeling the flames come up from the floor, and he knows he's got to go now. He runs as fast as he can. He hits it perfectly, jumps, 
as far as he can. It would have been a brand new world record if you could measure it. But he didn't make it halfway to the destination. The point of it is that this jump is an impossible jump to make. It's not possible. It can't be done. The same thing with us. The jump from earth to heaven based on our works alone is an impossible jump to make. The entire earth is being consumed with sin. And if we think that we're going to be able to make it to heaven on just our righteousness, our good works alone, that jump is not possible for us to make. And that's what Paul's saying here. So let, let's keep going to see if this kind of helps us out, if there, there's any hope in it. Verse 10 says, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. The word righteous is a legal term here, and Paul is using it uh, in a way to show like you're standing before the judge and something has happened to you. Uh, let's use a speeding ticket, for example. You're standing in front of the judge and you're being condemned for a speeding ticket. You can't say, because I've done all this other times good and I, I haven't been caught for so many years, just because I'm caught now, can't we forgive this? And, and the answer is, is no, you can't. What you've done in the past, you haven't given me any reason why I should let you go now. Did you do this? Well, yeah. Well, th well, that's the problem. As we continue in verse 11, it says, no one understands. We don't understand the way we should. We don't understand God the way we should. No one seeks God. We don't seek God like we should. All have turned aside. We want to do things our way. And you can see Paul is piling it on, piling on. And in the end of verse 12, it says, no one does good, no, not one. I mean, this is very, very simply being so clear with our condition. And it seems like Paul here is beating a dead horse. But what he's trying to, to make sure we understand is a lot of times in society, we think that there's this good to bad ratio. And if we're just on the positive side of this good to bad ratio, we'll be okay. If we help the hungry and we clothe the homeless and we do all of these great things, then our good to bad ratio will be okay. Well, it won't matter all these bad things that I've done or all these mistakes I've made because that ratio is where it should be. But what Paul is saying is that this ratio does not exist. There is no degree of lostness. We are all just lost. That's the point Paul is making here. So we get to verse 13. And luckily here, we know that, that Paul is now going to finally let up and, and give us the good news we've been waiting for since verse chapter 118. And we quickly realize that's not the case. He's actually taking the gloves off, and he's even going harder into this. This whole time, he's going back to the Old Testament, and he's showing the Jews, say, hey, look, this isn't just my words I'm telling you. These are different scriptures that I'm taking from the Psalms, from Ecclesiastes. He's like, you need to know your condition. He says their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. Their venom, the venom of, I really dislike trying to say this word. The, the, can, this is the ESV. Can we just say snake? Why is snake not allowed here? The venom of asps is under the lips. See, that's the problem is you laughed at that. So that just shows your sinful condition right there. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. What is happening here? is Paul is going out and showing that it's what comes out of your mouth. Here's a great example. What's coming out of your mouth is the very thing that I'm talking about. Instead of showing love, we spew anger. When we get hit with something that is uh, hurting for, to us or somebody makes fun of us, we want to spit back bad stuff. Their mouths are like an open grave. I think about Lazarus when they opened up the tomb and Jesus was going to raise him from the dead. They said, Jesus, you know that he's been in there for three days. His flesh is rotting. The smell is going to be horrible. That's the type of things that come out of our mouths. And we've got to be aware of that. And so that's what Paul is leading to. And so we go to verse 17 through 8 or 15 through 18. It says their feet are swift to shed blood. I mean, this doesn't get any easier. In their paths are ruin and misery, the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God in their eyes. Now, fear of, of God is something I've actually personally struggled with. I've never really understood this term. Is, am I supposed to be afraid of God? Am I supposed to cringe at thinking of him? Is God someone that I should be terrified of? And I found this verse that kind of helped me out, and maybe it'll help you out. You don't have to turn to it, but you can make a note of it. Psalm 130, verses 3 through 4, and it says, If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. 
Man, that, that's encouraging because that's, it's not about being terrified of God. It's about understanding the full, immense glory of God. God is big. He is huge. With a thought, he created the world. And with a thought, he can send a flood over it. God has the ability to hold life and death in his hands. And because of that, he is to be feared in that sense. And what Paul is saying is that there is no fear of God before their eyes. Now... We go to verse 19, hoping that there's at least some sort of positiveness that we can start to, to glean from all of this information. And he says, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. Again, it keeps going, and Paul's going back to this legal term again. He's going back to this courtroom like if there's a guy here that is guilty and everybody's laying out what's going on as far as why this person is guilty, when someone has understood their guilt at that point, when the jury knows, the judge knows, the people sitting in the sides and the audience know, there's nothing more for he can be said because the law, everything has been laid out and his mouth is shut. Uh, another example that I can give for this is my wife and I, we're a little weird in this area, so instead of watching the sitcoms or drama series, we like to watch Street Preachers on YouTube. I know it's kind of weird, just, just bear with me. So one of, one of the people that we like, hey babe, what do you want to do tonight? Oh, let's watch a Street Preacher on YouTube. This is great, just, just let that go. Uh, so we, we go online and one of the people we like to watch is Ray Comfort. Now, if you've ever watched Street Preaching Live or on, on YouTube before, you get plenty of drama in that, so I don't feel like we're missing out on anything. But he lays forth this condition really, really well. And so what I'm going to do is give you an example of how he shares this message. And I don't want you to raise your hands or anything, but as I'm saying each of these, just kind of think in your head if maybe this applies to you as well. I'm going to be doing the same thing. I, I already know the answer, and it's not good, but just, just follow with me. He'll go up to someone and say, have you ever told a lie? And of course their response is, yeah, of course, we've all, we've all said lies before. I mean, who hasn't? Well, what do you call someone that tells a lie? Well, a liar. Okay. Have you ever stolen something? Usually they're quick to say, oh, no, I've never stolen something. But he said, have you ever fudged on your taxes, wrote down so many extra miles, or taken somebody's from their tray when they weren't looking food, or, or maybe borrowed something and conveniently forgot to return it? Okay, well, yeah, I, I, I guess I've done that. Well, what do you call somebody that steals? Well, a thief. Okay. Have you ever used the Lord's name in vain? Oh, man, yeah, I guess I have done that. Well, a lot of people tend to do that, and they just throw that out there. Well, that's called blasphemy. Have you, have you ever looked at somebody with impure thoughts that's not your spouse? Could, it could be a TV star, a music icon, or even somebody walking down the street. Oh, yeah, I, I've, I've done that, of course. Well, that, Jesus says that you're committing adultery in your heart. Have you ever been angry, like really angry at someone? Oh, yes, all the time. I've definitely been angry at someone. Well, in 1 John, it says that you've committed murder in your heart. So by your own admittance, this isn't me, I'm not judging you, but what you've said is that you're a lying thief, blasphemer, who commits adultery and murders. So that's five of the Ten Commandments right there. And this just conversation just happened. So how do you think you're going to stand before a righteous and holy and just God that you've already done this just in this last five minutes that we've been talking? And at this point, they start to stutter and they start to not know what to say. And, and that's kind of the same point that Paul is making is that when we understand the law, our mouths are stopped. And so let's move to verse 20, and let's see if there's any hope for us there. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Well, I know Renault likes to talk, and I'm sorry I'm picking on you, Renault. I know Renault likes to talk about, oh, I've got eight kids, seven of them are teenagers, and, you know, all this other stuff. Well, I've got six kids at home, and I've got one on the way. I haven't not changed a diaper in a third of my life. So let's just put that in perspective here. But my wife's a rock star, so she created these chore sheets. She's laminated them. She put all the different chores, little dry erasers. She even put this pen on them so that she can hang them up. And so when our kids wake up in the morning, what they're to do is they're to grab their chore sheet. They're to mark them off, and it's supposed to be really easy and good. So that's the concept of it. Well, every week we go to look at these, and we wake up in the morning, and they have not completed them. We, I mean, these are easy chores, by the way. It's wake up, make your bed. Put on clothes, that's usually helpful. Brush your teeth, your sisters will thank you for that. 
So little things like that that will, you think are very easy to be done, but our kids can't do them. So we came up with this idea. Let's do the buddy system. And by we, it's really my wife that I'm married, so I get to claim that too. So by we, we created this idea of a buddy system. So this buddy system means that each one is paired up with another person so they can go through here and work together on If one person can't do it, the other will help them. If one person forgets one, they can go and help them. So this is a great idea. This should solve our problem. Do you know how many times our kids have completed their chore list? Still zero, not even one. So I was like, okay, here's what we've got to do. We've got to have an incentive behind this. So if we can say, let's say, at the end of the week, if you've completed all your chores, I'm going to take you to any movie that you'd like to see. I'll buy you popcorn, we'll have pretzels, we'll have candy, pizza, and you guys choose the movie. Do you think that that helps? No. They still could not do it. I have still not taken these kids to one movie. That's it, which is great on my pocketbook. It's, it's a very good thing. But the point is, is that our kids, even with given something so simple, still in their nature, they want to do things like watch TV or play or do other things. Now, if you're following this analogy, you're probably thinking, okay, well, Tony, what did you do or how did you fix this problem? You probably sat them on the couch and you got on your hands and knees and you tried to show them what it means to be a servant, how to serve your family, how to be Jesus, and using this opportunity to show your kids what true love is. And that's probably what you, at least please nod your head in thinking I'm at least that good. Well, the problem is, is that, no, that's not what I did. Actually, I'm over here in the corner repenting because I'm committing murder by wanting to mentally beat my kids, and I can't do that. So we are both all in this complete sinful situation. My kids can't do it. I'm losing my cool over here, and we're all just proving over and over and over what Paul says here. Well, that leads us then to the end. We, we've gone through these verses, and there's still no hope. But next week, we hear two words, and these, by many people saying, are the two most glorious words in all of Scripture. And if you have your Bibles in front of you, those two words are, but now. Since chapter 1, verse 18, all the way through 320, we've been hearing all these different aspects of our condition. We've been realizing our sinful state over and over. And now we get to this point where we get to understand what is to come, and that but now is amazing. And theologians and scholars have agreed that this next section of scripture is one of the greatest scriptures in the entire Bible. But what does that do for us right now, here today? I want to go back to verse 20, and I want to point out something that may be easily missed. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. That word justified, Paul's using it in a negative term here. But that word justified, that's what we're looking for. That's what our hope is. What we need to do is we need to stand before God, a righteous and holy and just God, and be justified for him. Paul is telling us that we can't do that, that it is impossible because we're not good enough. Our good to bad ratio doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what we do for other people. We are still in a sense of lostness. We are all lost. That is where the gospel comes in. We can't understand the gospel if we can't understand sin. We've got to grasp that first. Paul has labored through this section on sin to make sure that we can never say that we're going to heaven because we're good people. So what I'd like to do in just a couple of minutes that I have left is, is lay out for you the great, the great question that the Bible lays out for us. All of the Bible is a conflict of this certain aspect and the resolution to it. The Bible says God is good. From the very beginning, from the Garden of Eden until he comes back in, in Revelation, all through the covenant, the promises and the grace, everything points to God is good. And we hear that and we're like, yes, God is good. I actually got a text the other day of my friend, something really awesome happened. He's like, dude, God is good. And I'm like, yeah, God is good because God is good. But the problem is we are not. How do we reconcile that? If God is good and we are not, what does that mean? What happens? Well, oftentimes someone will say, well, God is love. And that is so true. And that is so awesome. And we got to just grab onto that and hang on to that. But if God is love, and he forgives our sins because God is love, God is no longer just. God is no longer holy. So God can't just forgive our sins because he is love, because he'd have to pull away his other attributes to do that. And God can't do that. 
So we've got a problem. We've got a loving but a just and a holy and a righteous and a wrathful God. And how do we, how do we fit all of these together? And that is where the answer comes from God and not from man. The one being of God is understood in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father sent the Son to earth, and he lived the perfect life to fulfill the law and then became the perfect sacrifice on the cross. The book of Isaiah says that Jesus was crushed for our iniquities. When Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was at that time, this whole condition that we've been dealing with, Jesus took on the sins of all of us from past, present, and future. Everything took upon himself at that time. And, and it says in Isaiah that he was crushed. A holy and just and wrathful God took out the punishment that was due for us upon his son and that is how he was able to appease every attribute that's how he can lovingly come to us and we can stand before him that's how he can satisfy his justness that he's not giving up his that part of his his attribute in order to appease this situation of sin so is that it well, in a sense, yes, that is it. But we have a responsibility. Upon God granting us this understanding of the gospel by the Holy Spirit, and this is the key word, we are compelled to respond to it. If our eyes are open and we see this and we understand it, we're reminded of John three sixteen. Everybody seems to know this verse and put paint under eyes and everything. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever should believe in him will have everlasting life. But a lot of people get mixed up on that word believe. Oh, I believe in him. That's great. But if you believe, it's so much more than just the word that we commonly think of that we believe. If we believe in him, then we're going to be compelled to follow and to repent. And the word repent is very key here. It's not just to confess our sins, but it's to confess and then do a 180. It means to completely turn away from the life that we were living. And we're not doing this to earn salvation. We're not doing this because that will help our good to bad ratio. We're doing this because we're compelled to do it because what Jesus has done, when our eyes are open to that and we see it and we understand our condition, that we can't go from earth to heaven without it. We can't stand before a righteous and holy God without that. We are compelled to repent and turn and follow him. And that's the gospel, and that's what we are called to do. When we understand this gospel, this is why we then come to church. This is why we sing songs. This is why we praise. This is why we pray. This is why we worship. This is why we serve our communities. Is because of this very thing right here. So if this is your first time that you have understood this message, then I plead with you to repent and give your life over to the one who gave his life to you. Thank you.